Awesome. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Bard Graduate Center. Um, my name is Andrew Kircher. I'm the Director of Public Humanities and Research here. And um, I'm so pleased to welcome you to the second of what is a three event series called Faculty in Focus this semester with Freya Hartzell. Um, and next semester, we'll go on another faculty in focus journey, this time with Drew Thompson. So this semester, we're looking at dolls and human likeness. Next semester, it will be the Polaroid as an object of black material culture. Um, and uh, so tonight, we are so fortunate to have uh, Emily St. Hilaire with us. Uh, Emily is a multidisciplinary artist and doctoral candidate in the humanities at Concordia University in Montreal, Canada. Her interdisciplinary research examines the subcultural phenomenon of reborn dolls, which are hyper-realistic baby dolls from a feminist perspective. This topic prompts questions regarding non-reproductive mothering, adult play, relationships with synthetic companions, and therapeutic self-care. Emily's artistic practice expands on these themes through sculptural installation and uh, photographic productions. She's exhibited her artwork at Canadian and international galleries and festivals, and has also authored and co-authored writing about ethics and research creation in Canada Art Review, Canadian Art Review rather, and the International Journal of Bioethics. Her work has been supported by the FRQSC, by Concordia University, Hexagram Network, Francophone, and the Canada Council for the Arts. Um, and so after we uh, uh, enjoy this lecture from Emily, then Freya Hartzell uh, will join us uh, via Zoom and we'll have an opportunity for a conversation and questions from you. But right now, please join me in welcoming Emily St. Hilaire. Thank you. To begin, I want to tell you about this, uh, Nathaniel. Nathaniel is a university student, and he has fallen in love with a beautiful woman who is a great dancer and an attentive listener. Nathaniel feels deeply understood by this woman, and he hopes to marry her. The young man describes his great love to a skeptical friend as follows. Olympia may well seem uncanny to you, cold, prosaic people. It is only to the poetic heart that the like unfolds itself. It was only for me that the look of love arose and flooded through mind and senses. Only in Olympia do I find myself again. As you may have guessed, this woman is not a human being. She is in fact an automaton named Olympia. She and Nathaniel are fictional characters from E.T.A. Hoffman's 1817 story entitled The Sandman. I chose to highlight Nathaniel and his declaration of love for Olympia here to remind us that falling in love with dolls, automatons, and statues is nothing new. Also, I love how this description by Hoffman demonstrates how the synthetic companion not only has life, but brings life to Nathaniel. There are many examples of Pygmalionism throughout history, the most infamous being the original tale of Pygmalion, from Ovid's first century collection of poems, Metamorphosis. Whereas the term Pygmalionism commonly refers to the condition of loving a statue, image, or inanimate objects, uh, inanimate object, Ovid's poem follows the character of Pygmalion who lovingly sculpted his ideal woman out of ivory. So he was the creator of the object of his affection. According to post-classical accounts of the poem, Pygmalion named his beloved Galatea. Anthropologists A. Scobie and A. J. W. Taylor explain that, quote, Pygmalion shunned marriage with real women because of their supposed viciousness. He fashioned an ideal woman for himself out of ivory and successfully appealed to Venus to animate the statue, end quote. Pygmalion's actions are somewhat practical in that he was able to solve his problem with women by creating a woman according to his own preferences. The endurance and popularity of the story of Pygmalion speaks perhaps to the appeal of the fantasy of creating a perfect partner from scratch. A narrative that attests to a de desire for perfection in and control of one's love partner. This fantasy in and of itself may seem innocent enough, especially if we keep in mind that the synthetic companion is not real. But the tendency is troubling. 
given the history of limiting autonomy and repressing independent thought in women. Consider, for example, how often women have historically been made to act like dolls, silent, meticulous, um, meticulously dressed, pliable. Whether in reality or in fictional depictions, this comprises a lingering stereotype that conflates dolls and women as malleable and powerless. This long-standing stereotype may contribute to lingering preferences for the doll-like and for dolls. This overlap between human and human-like and the fear or uneasiness that comes with the not-quite-human accounts for the many conventions and restrictions around the use of human figures throughout history. Nevertheless, dolls continue to act as surfaces, surfaces onto which to project dreams and visions. Facing an empty figure can allow a reflection of the self, unsullied by the perception of another person. It can allow for an empowering rehearsal of love, whatever form that may take. And this can therefore allow for cathartic interactions that might not otherwise be possible. Through the doll, an owner can see how they can be seen, how they would like to be seen. And this can provide comfort and confidence and contribute to self-actualization. Like a therapeutic tool, some people use dolls for a limited time or for different reasons at different times. Synthetic relationship is my preferred term for the practice of sustaining meaningful interactions, um, meaningful personal interactions with a synthetic companion. In a synthetic relationship, the companion may take the form of a human figure or it may exist exclusively as an artificial intelligence, such as a chatbot, for example. The term synthetic, which means artificial, invented, or an imitation, refers not to the relationship or the emotions produced, but to the human companion. The non-human companion, sorry. The emotions that emerge from a person's synthetic relationship are real. Synthetic relationships can produce many of the emotions experienced in ordinary or organic relationships, um, and social robots that are currently being designed for exactly this purpose um, alongside other tasks such as health monitoring. I believe synthetic relationships with dolls are instructive when it comes to understanding the potential for social robots and AI generally in, um, to develop meaningful relationships with people. Artificial human figures have always been seen as a threat to the social order because of their likeness to human bodies. In the 7th century before the Common Era, iconoclasm emerged as a political action against rulers who used statues of themselves and their gods to assert dominance. The statue has power as a representation and as a representative of its owner or creator. Furthermore, the idea that a figure could be mistaken for a human, like an imposter, has been a long-standing concern with human figures. Equally troubling is the possibility that a person might care for a synthetic human as if it were real, thereby losing touch with reality and real people. The social stigma that makes doll play and synthetic relationships unacceptable for adults leads many doll enthusiasts to keep their enjoyment private. Although a fictional example um, that we see here, a scene from the film Her, this same social stigma is experienced by characters like Theodore, who initiate relationships with operating systems. In this scene, we see Theodore enjoying a lovely day out with Samantha um, as they talk, and she sees what he sees via his mobile device in his pocket. The fact is, for some, intimacy with a human figure or artificial intelligence is preferable over intimacy with a real person. Inanimate, uh, intimate situations, sorry, intimate situations can cause a person to feel vulnerable, which is why for some, a doll is an ideal surrogate partner for such interactions. With a doll, the doll owner maintains complete control. Synthetic relationships may appear narcissistic to a fault, but the practices I will describe here actually demonstrate a strong desire for social connection. Although adult doll play remains a fringe activity, there are a growing number of supportive real-world communities available to enthusiasts. It is important to note that synthetic relationships normally exist in addition to organic relationships, a point that is frequently overlooked. Synthetic relationships fulfill a different emotional desire than organic relationships. 
In recent history, technological enhancements have provided strong justification for creating human figures. Robots, for example, can perform service work. But new forms of surrogates have not alleviated the long-standing fear that these synthetic humans or their admirers could become uncontrollable. On the contrary, the fear of synthetic life grows as human figures become more realistic, with material advancements such as silicone bringing synthetic faces to life. Reactions to artificial life seem outsized, however, given the actual pace of development of artificial intelligence. Both reborn dolls and sex dolls have benefited from enhancement via sophisticated materials such as high-grade silicone in order to produce an uncannily realistic appearance. And I'll describe both reborn dolls and, and sex dolls shortly. Um, this level of realism that we have now supports the illusion that the human figure is alive, but a doll owner hoping to develop a meaningful relationship with their doll must not simply delight in an optical illusion that is a striking iconic representation. They must also be willing to engage their imagination. In this way, every interaction with one's doll is an investment in its status as a companion. How does this interaction work, given that the doll owner knows that their doll is a carefully crafted object and not a living being? Imaginative perception is the use of one's imagination to consider a circumstance in relation to a perceived image or object that would not be evident without the use of imagination. I borrow this term from philosopher Ketrin Misselhorn. Drawing from debates on pictorial representation, Misselhorn explains, quote, pictorial experience invokes a combination of perception and imagination. We simultaneously perceive the marks on the surface of a picture and imagine the depicted, end quote. A human figure can be both an object and a person. Another term for this way of perceiving life within a figure is offered by theater scholar Steve Tillis. Tillis describes a double vision that enables an audience to paradoxically see both a puppet and the character it portrays simultaneously. Audiences are willing to translate the representations of the object into life. Tillis offers the following resolution. The, uh, uh, quote, the audience is willing to imagine the puppet as having life because to do so fulfills the basic human desire to understand the world through the prism of human consciousness. The puppet's lack of consciousness is perceived as a perceived object is thus an invitation for the audience to participate in the creation of life similar to their own. End quote. Witnessing the dramas of life played out in miniature invites viewers to reflect upon the dramas of their own life from a distanced perspective. A miniature representation of the world is a contained and controllable world. Generally, things can't get too out of hand when characters are, in fact, the size of one's hand. Life-size dolls, however, do not have the diminutive powerlessness of small puppets and miniatures. Herein lies the root of the contentiousness of realistic dolls, the more they resemble a real human, the more power they hold. For doll owners, surrogate humans enable an imagination of life that plays out in tangible ways. Dolls in their unchanging state are imbued with a kind of immortality. For mortal humans, the relentless passage of time inflects powerlessness. Synthetic relationships offer doll owners the possibility to recuperate power over the passage of time. Furthermore, the object, an object representative of power in society shares in the power of the represented. The owner of the representation owns this power since the object is under her control. Sex dolls have been around for a long time, but they've really grown in popularity since the turn of the 21st century. The establishment of manufacturers who use silicone and strong internal armatures to create realistic adult-sized dolls has led to increased cultural awareness of sex dolls and awareness of their use as a synthetic companion that goes beyond sex. This image features a doll used in an online ad for the sale of a car. The doll was used here as a surrogate for a person pointing at some rust, pointing at the vehicle, and this image went viral after it was posted. This is a good example of how sex dolls are often placed in everyday situations and photographed by doll owners. According to a 2018 survey of sex doll owners, 
by anthropologists Mitchell Lancaster James and Jillian R. Bentley, motivations for sex doll ownership include companionship, sex, difficulties with real relationships, mental health, and photography. Only 14%... Only 14% of survey respondents stated that sex was exclusively the core element of their sex doll relationship. The surveyed doll owners describe a complex engagement with their dolls, and this sheds light on how the realism of the doll supports the emotional investment of the owner. Visual appearance was an important factor for doll owners. The companionship provided by the doll is sufficient, and in many cases the doll is the preferred partner. The following survey responses demonstrate the unwillingness or disinterest for some doll owners to engage in sexual or romantic relationships with fellow humans. These individuals prefer companions who make no demands or complaints, yet they still seek a partner in the form of a human figure. The doll represents a woman in form, and that highly convincing form is good enough. Hearing from doll owners directly provides the most accurate insight into synthetic relationships. One respondent stated, quote, Physical human contact has always given me a lot of anxiety, but now just the thought of it makes me feel like I'm going to have a panic attack. I felt lonely and very depressed, but did not want the burden of a relationship. And then I began to believe there was a third option in between together and alone. My doll is a safe where I lock away the parts of me that are too vulnerable for the real world. End quote. This testimonial demonstrates a desire for intimacy that would involve a level of vulnerability or loss of control in an organic relationship with a human being. Safety and comfort can be found within the limitations of dolls as social beings. But dolls can also prompt elaborate fantasies through the use of imaginative perception. Another of Lancaster James and Bentley's respondents stated, quote, A typical conversation when arriving home would be me getting into bed, waking her up, and telling her that she missed her telling me that she missed me and that she loves me. She'll ask me to cuddle with her and tell her about my day. Sometimes she'll ask me to help her change or brush braid, play with her hair. I then ask her what she dreamed about while I was gone, and she tells me. Sometimes she has beautiful dreams and sometimes she has terrible nightmares, but she always knows she'll be okay because I'll be there when she wakes up, end quote. So this respondent imaginatively perceives that his doll has a personal life and he views himself as a protector or otherwise comforting presence for his doll. Constructing a personality for one's doll can influence self-perception through the role play involved in bringing a fantasy to life visually and physically. Through the eyes of the doll, the owner appears as he desires to be seen. Other respondents similarly describe the quotidian activities they engage in with their dolls, such as sleeping in bed, watching TV, or having sex. In the film Lars and the Real Girl, a still seen here, um, the main character Lars never consummates his relationship with his doll Bianca because, as he explains to friends and family, she's religious. The two are seen engaging in other domestic activities together. Although this is another fictional example, the cases described by Lancaster, James, and Bentley, as well as by other researchers, demonstrate that there are plenty of synthetic relationships happening right now all around the world. Doll ownership can be empowering and can offer a sense of control. I propose that synthetic relationships not necessarily be seen as antisocial, but demonstrative of a desire to connect and care for others. Online communities of support further empower doll owners in ways that were not possible prior to the 21st century. Although not demanding what a real person would require in a relationship, sex dolls, um, sex dolls and reborn dolls represent... uh, present opportunities for selflessness and caregiving. The perception that a doll requires not only material maintenance, but uh, but care and even love, can enhance for a doll owner the feeling of being needed. Performing this labor of love fulfills their own need for attachment and reduces stress, anxiety, and loneliness. Providing care can increase the bond a doll owner feels towards their doll. This bond helps to deepen the relationship and adds weight to the feelings produced. 
This is a good moment to mention that not every doll owner would qualify their attachment to their dolls as having the status of a relationship. There are many enthusiasts and collectors who appreciate the artistry or other qualities of human figures without experiencing a bond that qualifies as a synthetic relationship. It is safe to say that there are degrees of attachment and imaginative perception, from the most basic anthropomorphization to deeply intimate connections. Reborn dolls are hyper-realistic baby dolls that are created by an artist who paints the vinyl or silicone body with many, many layers of paint in order to achieve the most realistic features possible. Something I want to make very clear is that reborn dolls are not used for sexual activity. The photos you see here were submitted by participants in a photo voice project I conducted in 2018. The image on the right is of one participant's father holding her reborn doll. She states, All my dolls have special meaning for me. I have tremendous appreciation for all the members of my family who have accepted my doll Bart and accept me. They themselves have grown by allowing themselves to enjoy Bart. We are all normal, sane, well-educated, loving people who fully understand he is a doll. We are bold enough to fully enjoy him and publicly educate others that are brave enough to ask about him and want to know more. Only great things have come from my interest in reborn dolls and bringing Bart into my family. I strongly feel that people should be able to love this hobby and other harmless hobbies without fear of shame or embarrassment. So as mentioned here, it's important to note that reborn owners are aware that these are dolls. Outside the context of doll therapy and dementia care, I've never met anyone who has met anyone who believes their doll is a real baby. And that's not necessarily what you see in fictional depictions, or even certain um, articles will kind of play that in not accurately. So furthermore, um, reborn doll collectors are not exclusively childless women over a certain age, as many people assume. I conducted an anonymous survey in 2018 at a large reborn doll convention, and only a slight majority of my 67 respondents were over the age of 35. Approximately half of respondents have children, and I had 57, uh, sorry, 59 male and 7 male respondents, as well as one tr uh, self-identified transgender male respondent. These data bring into question common assumptions about who collects reborns and why. Unfortunately, a majority of articles and news stories misleadingly portray all collectors as older women who either have no children, have lost a child, or have empty nest syndrome because their children are adults. This stereotype is perpetuated by journalists or scholars who rely upon existing media and even fictional depictions of reborn doll owners rather than meeting collectors firsthand, or they seek out collectors willing to share a particular kind of story. The actual reasons why collectors enjoy reborn dolls are much more interesting and complex than loneliness or grief alone. According to my survey, the top six activities undertaken with reborn dolls were dressing, as in changing clothes, cuddling, making the dolls, which is known as reborning, shopping for accessories, shopping for, um, shopping for accessories, photographing the dolls, and socializing with other enthusiasts. Um, the shopping for the doll is also kind of part of the fun. For many doll owners, reborns reduce stress and can alleviate anxiety. The doll can be left alone for long periods and then picked up for a cuddle anytime. There are a range of benefits and motivations evident amongst reborn doll enthusiasts. Some reborn, um, some reborn owners enjoy role-playing or imagining a personality for the doll, while others just appreciate the aesthetic and tactile qualities. This comparison list shows just how similar sex dolls and reborn dolls are in terms of characteristics and the activities they enable. Reborn dolls most commonly take the form of a baby. Sex dolls most commonly take the form of an adult woman. Um, for both, there are adult collectors and owners. Um, a lot of kids do like reborn dolls, but they're so fragile and expensive that a lot of artists actually say this is not a toy, this is not for children. Um, but there's different, different kinds. The higher the realism, the more expensive it's going to be. They both offer companionship and comfort. They enable imaginative play. Maintenance and care is required for both. There's clothing change possible. For both types of dolls, there are some mechanical options available. 
and the sexual activity part is different. I could add to this list that true reborns are handmade, whereas few sex dolls are handmade like throughout the process. This list is not comprehensive, but it touches upon several aspects and features of these dolls that are interesting to consider. In both cases, the limited options, um, mechanical options that are available today are not widely adopted. Advanced features are expensive and have limitations, such as being noisy or they're simply not convincing. It is interesting to consider this in relation to the imagining of a futuristic robot social companion. I believe that by having less mechanical ability, dolls leave more room for imaginative perception, and this should not be underestimated. Considering how some sex doll owners describe their preference for a silent partner, which is reminiscent of Pygmalion's issue with women, why would such a doll owner desire a personality that's outside of their control? So there's a lot going on here. On the one hand, I've said that synthetic companions can be read as reaching towards social companionship, but the practices of doll collectors can be extremely self-focused and private. And there's no challenge here in terms of encountering a social other. Regarding this, I think it's worth noting that for some, dolls are part of a transitional process that grows or wanes as needed. Dolls can be used to assist in a difficult time and then set aside. Dolls can support the emotional well-being of individuals, but doll ownership can be also be detrimental due to social stigma. In addition to synthetic relationships, most doll owners maintain relationships with friends, family, coworkers, and other people. Whether or not those people are supportive of dolls and synthetic relationships is certainly a separate question. One of the old fears regarding Pygmalionism and a love of dolls is that the dolls would entirely replace real people for the doll owner. It's worth reconsidering this caveat of adult doll enjoyment given that synthetic relationships clearly hold potential for positive benefits. Whether visually, whether visually through touch or via convincing dialogue, the impressive ways in which human-like entities imitate living beings is what sells us on the fantasy that they are human-like at all. Based on the multitude of stories that exist in which dolls, mannequins, or toys come to life, audiences are clearly eager to see these creations come alive, regardless of the consequences. This devel the development of robotics and artificial intelligence has provided a new justification for the creation of human figures, namely that androids could perform the service work that humans find unappealing, time-consuming, or that there simply isn't anyone available to do. For at least the latter half of the 20th century, science fiction and cinematic storytelling has provided an endless supply of robotic surrogates, surrogate humans in the form of cyborgs, replicants, automatons, synths, and so on. They generally start out with a mission of servitude and support of humans. These representations have extended far beyond what is actually possible in terms of visual likeness and mechanical abilities of robots. Still, the fantasy of an electronic servant and the need for companionship justify the development of human-like figures. For many doll owners, visual likeness is more important than mechanical ability, and clearly dolls can vividly come to life for the owner with minimal intervention. Much like Nathaniel, who fell in love with a woman who barely spoke, in some cases, less is more. I want to propose that in terms of bonding, providing care for a synthetic companion and leaving room for imagination is more important than the technological abilities of the artificial human. The social stigma against synthetic, relationship, synthetic relationships is rooted in centuries of parabolic storytelling about the dangers of artificial life. As we learn more about the potential outcomes and positive affective states produced by synthetic relationships, adult doll enthusiasm should be considered within the context of personal well-being and self-actualization. It is probable that synthetic relationships will continue to gain prominence and cultural relevance in the future as outdated social conventions fail to reflect the realities of the advanced digital era. Let's remember too that it is not the doll itself that has been policed over the past few hundred years so much as the doll owner. And this simply reflects the dangers of going against the status quo. Virtual communities supporting fringe interests have enabled individuals to connect and rise above social opprobrium they face when pursuing their hobbies. Doll collectors are frequently quoted saying, if I'm not hurting anyone, there's no harm, and they feel they should be free to enjoy their hobby as they please. 
I mention this because doll owners are frequently the subject of human interest news stories that go viral every month or so as news outlets pick up on the hobby. Editors tend to write story leads that sound shocking, but the most fascinating aspect of synthetic relationships is how commonplace it is for someone to prefer the company of dolls. At least some of the time. The examples described here demonstrate that there is a range of collectors with countless personal reasons for doll ownership and affection for dolls and statues is nothing new. What is unique today is how synthetic relationships can develop with the support of imaginative perception, advanced materials, and online communities of support. Dolls offer a sense of power and control, so an increase in doll enthusiasm could be seen as an increase in the desire for control. The physical presence of the doll is a powerful prompt for the creation of a synthetic relationship. In Etienne Bonneau de Conziac's 1754 Treatise on the Sensations, touch is described as a sense by which we come to know that there are bodies other than ourselves. Touch aids us in the identification and differentiation of ourselves and others. For those living a solitary life or experiencing loneliness, the ability to touch another body, even a synthetic one, can be a comfort and can affirm one's sense of self. In this respect, silicone is a great advancement over cloth, leather, marble, and other materials used in the creation of human figures in the past. Silicone is soft, supple, and it holds pigment well. The provision of material goods, for example, shopping for one's doll, can help owners bond with their synthetic companions, as can other kinds of care. Often when people see adults using dolls, there is an assumption that the doll is being used as a therapeutic tool. Given that health and well-being are complex and ever-changing states, it isn't possible to know exactly what benefit a doll may be supplying to an individual on any given day. Assumptions about the presence of a mental health or social problem because of what is perceived as a synthetic therapeutic sorry, treatment should be avoided. Evidence from doll therapy in the field of dementia care demonstrates that providing care can actually fulfill an individual's need for attachment, even when that care is directed towards a doll. Drawing from this research and other studies mentioned here, including my own, a range of benefits that can be identified from doll ownership include comfort, anti-anxiety, anti-loneliness, a passion for collecting, defeating the passage of time, identity building, exerting control, connecting to a community, and of course, fun. It's often a primary motivation for doll enthusiasts. These benefits are exclusive to those who have chosen to connect with a doll. For those who are interested, synthetic relationships can contribute to well-being and the fulfillment of needs where alternatives could be detrimental or are non-existent. The personal stories of reborn and sex doll owners attest to the fact that they feel a strong bond and a sense of duty towards their dolls. Given the individualistic nature of contemporary urban life and the virtual or otherwise synthetic quality of many interactions and activities today, is it, su is it surprising that many, dolls, uh, that many adults are finding fulfillment and feeling needed by a surrogate human? Doll ownership is not for everyone, but the emotional investment is worthwhile and beneficial for those who choose to share their life with dolls. Looking at how doll owners use their imagination to bring a synthetic companion to life, regardless of what it is they're doing, provides insight into how robots might enter our lives and come to mean something to us. Not in place of, but in, in addition to existing relationships. Thanks. <laughs> I have brought a couple dolls, so I will be able to pass them throughout the room. And um, there's two. So this doll is a uh, reborn that I made from the kit. So I reborned her myself and uh, she goes by the name of Fabi. And um, I'll pass her around. The other one is a chimpanzee uh, doll. And this is part of a category of fantasy animal reborns that also exists. So you can uh, have a feel. So while the dolls are passed around the room, uh, we will have a brief conversation 
Uh, first between uh, Emily and Freya, because as I mentioned, this whole sort of trajectory of faculty and focus is really, uh, it's an opportunity for Freya to dig deeper into this question of dolls and human likeness. And so Freya identified three uh, scholars and, and artists that she wanted to engage with. Uh, so this is this is a moment for the two of you first, and then I'll open up uh, for a chance uh, for you all to ask some questions as well. But first, Freya. Thank you. Um, I have this, this, first of all, thank you, Emily, so much. This provokes so many questions for me and so many thoughts. Um, and I think I, I'm, I'm sort of looking at the notes that I was taking while you were speaking. And I think one of, it feels like there's a, um, kind of a lot of different sorts of irony going on here that I love. And one of them to me is this sense of um, play that play maybe for adults and for children play works better when it's not overdetermined. And I, I kind of, I, I liked that you kept returning or, you know, a few different times you talked about the sort of mechanical, um, you know, our, our fantasies about what the mechanical, um, affordances of, you know, robots might be. Um, I know when we were talking the other day, we were talking about the the movie Ex Machina and sort of this, you know, wild fantasy of a robot that looks exactly like a human. Um, but this this kind of, at least to me, it seems like an irony of the more the more the doll can do things on its own, the more it can kind of interact with you, the less the less of a relationship there actually is. Um, and I wondered. I wondered if you had sort of more thoughts on that. I would be really curious to hear what you think. Mm -hmm. Thanks. No, it is so interesting to think through. And um, without the evidence that does come up through the research on sex dolls and through my research with reborn dolls, um, I certainly would never have kind of come to, to, to think through those questions. Um, it was important to bring in the sex doll research because there's a lot more of it. There's only beginning to be research looking at um, reborn doll collectors and what are the real characteristics of those relationships. Um, there's even more research on doll therapy and dementia care. So I've looked at those studies as well to know what's going on there. And um, again, it's a little bit even hard to tell in those contexts because you don't know. But the benefits that become visible are that the doll brings out a social aspect, um, particularly for uh, folks with Alzheimer's or dementia, it can reduce agitation. And this is a non-pharmaceutical option. There are a lot of issues with pharmaceutical options for um, caring for, for people in this situation. So yeah, um, I guess it just struck me that that fantasy is, first of all, we're so far from it. And there's like this fear. So having a really realistic robot in visual form almost like implies that we're almost at this like singularity moment of, you know, being fooled by these robots. And um, it just doesn't seem to be the case. But what we do have are these real synthetic relationships happening with real emotions and bonding happening. So, yeah, I guess um, that's that's kind of how I got to this point. But it's uh, maybe just the beginning of what more what more can I look at in that front is, you know, a future direction for sure. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that was really occurring to me um, in relation to actually your lunchtime talk yesterday was this question that you brought up, which for me kind of was the, like the central question. I think when you were talking about um, the idea of the uncanny and sort of when things get hyper real or, you know, when they, when they, when we are unsure about the real or the imaginary. And that's something that I've thought about a lot in my other work too, before coming to this project. And I'm wondering about um, if that, that didn't really, that didn't really come up as much directly in this talk tonight. And I'm, you know, I'm wondering if, um, if there is a, if there's a threat here, if it matters at all, I mean, you know, I think in the beginning you were talking about almost what I would call like sort of siphoning off or filtering out characteristics that you don't like about humans, you know, like you, it, the baby cries too much. So you don't have to have that. You just have the baby that doesn't cry, you know, 
um, or, you know, the, the, the partner has an annoying habit and, you know, you don't have to have that. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, you know, I like so much that your approach is so, um, your approach is just so much about research and not about judgment, right? Because I feel like this is a topic where, and, and no, you, I'm sure you've encountered this, like people are very quick to make judgments and also quick to take positions in relation to a perceived threat. Um, and I guess I'm wondering about this question of, is there a threat? Like, how important is that to your work? And do you, do you find yourself kind of having to step back and sort of recalibrate and say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm just doing this research. I'm not here to make a judgment about human beings. And, and that, that just seems like a kind mm -hmm. of elephant in the room. Yeah. Or on the flip side, am I here to be an advocate for reborn doll collectors? That certainly was never my my intention starting out, but it became so clear early on that there was a lot of um, judgment of women happening. And so really poking at those questions and peeling back, you know, what is that threat of a woman with a doll? What is, like what's wrong with that? Um, and I think that relates to sort of how we view play and it having an educational purpose for young people. So a little girl is given a doll perhaps to think about mothering and, um, you know, training towards that, um, that aspect of what may or may not be a part of her life. But what is uh, an adult playing going to be learning or developing as far as skills? And on the other hand, you can look at video gaming, fantasy sport leagues, model trains, are these just model babies in the same way? So um, yeah, the play factor is really interesting. And um, I think we have a good example in the room of that uncanny because the chimp doll is like hilariously <laughs> um, not realistic. And yet there, I mean, it's a realist, I, I haven't looked at a chimp up close, but um, yeah, there were some good reactions in the room to to the, the look of the chimp. So the the playfulness um, comes out as well within the community and that became clear to me especially going to the doll exposition a gathering of 500 in doll enthusiasts um, reborns specifically in the U.S. that I went to that was an atmosphere of just joy and admiring the artist's work having a competition they had a baby shower event where you could buy a ticket and there was all sorts of events and challenges and food um no drinks. It was in Utah. So, <laughs> um, but still a really, a really fun gathering for, for collectors. So I guess that really just gave me the sense that, you know, even, even things like an adoption certificate or putting a diaper on the doll, it's all done in a very knowing, um, way. And really the doll is the preferred thing. So there, you know, it, we've heard, um, or, at my talk yesterday, I played a little clip from a video, someone saying, this baby doesn't cry. Um, as you mentioned, Freya, there's, uh, there's big differences. And truly, like, they want a doll. Uh, that's something I think that tonight's talk highlighted as well. It's not uh, really a surrogate, which then reinforces what is the threat. You're not going to have, you know, women going out to steal real babies just because they like babies and baby stuff. So it's kind of a nice um, way to enjoy babies and baby things without having to have a baby um, or maybe reminisce and, and have that, uh, that experience with the doll. So. Yeah. I, th I think I have just one more comment and then I'll, uh, you know, I'll let you guys do your thing. <laughs> um, but the, I was so struck and I don't know, you know, uh, I don't know if it's me trying to make everything into a bigger a bigger thing than it is, but I was very struck when you talked about um, um, Steve Tillis, who is somebody we talked about yesterday too, um, and this, you know, this this double vision where or or imaginative perception. I love this term too that you can you know you can understand something as an object, and also imagine its life as something else. Um, and I hadn't quite made a connection in my own mind, at least. To, that also to me seems like a very good definition of play in some ways that you are you are occupying this very kind of ambiguous space um where things are sort of shifting positions and subjects and objects are sort of like 
in a dance of sorts. And I, I kind of, that seems like a very inspiring thing to me, especially right at the moment, you know, where it seems like so much of life right now is about taking a position and not deviating from it and kind of, you know, swearing allegiance to something and, um, and this idea of sort of occupying this flexible space, you know, where something might be one way at one moment and another way at another moment, um, seems like in many ways an antidote to that kind of rigidity. Um, and I, I don't know, I'm curious if you have thoughts about that, but that's mm-hmm. really more me on a soapbox. No, I- that's a good <laughs> point about the current, the current moment and how it can feel so, uh, kind of rigid in that way, black or white, uh, something that's come to mind is the the play theorist Brian Sutton Smith talks about, um, I think it's him, referring to studying animals in play and how a puppy will nip and it's pretending, it's play fighting. It, the nip is not a, a, a bite, it's a nip. And so there's, yeah, maybe space for that within this practice for sure. It's mothering, but it's not mothering. And so... I I struggled with that question because I did all this reading on motherhood and maternal theory. And then I was like, is that even what's going on here? Because when I spoke to people, there's not changing diapers and giving bottles or breastfeeding. Like that's the sort of sensationalizing, I think, of what's really going on because the people I talk to aren't doing those kind of things. They're certainly not sharing that with me, but you do find videos on YouTube of certain routines and role play that I feel are really more for YouTube. So that's a performative thing for an audience. And there are there is an audience for that. There's lots of um, accounts to follow if you want to watch people play with their reborns and play with dolls. I mean, there's YouTube channels for absolutely everything, but that's one of them. So no, I think that's a really good um, question and perhaps a space where this this practice with dolls can maybe even be instructive to um, yeah, opening up this this other space, this third space of play for for adults or or whoever for those who are interested. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, now is an opportunity for us to open up the conversation to include you all. Uh, I just have uh, one sort of ground rule that I'd love to establish in the spirit of generosity. If you have a comment. That's what the beer and wine moment after the event is for. Um, Please cut straight to the question because that opens up the space for everybody to participate. Um, I will model uh, first just by saying, um, I I want to know, how did you get, how did you fall into this subject? Um, Yes, it it came about in 2016. Never would have thought that I would be doing um, a PhD, which is years of my life thinking about dolls. But uh, in a class that I was taking for my coursework, I watched a video on YouTube. Um, It was a documentary about reborn dolls. And in retrospect, really sensationalizing the practices of some reborn doll owners. So that piqued my interest hugely because they they really made it look as if these women were pretending it was a baby doll, just all the first impressions you get, you know. So I totally get um, being in that position of feeling creeped out, curious, what's going on here. Um, And for me, that led to uh, a new topic for my PhD. And so the rest is history. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, yes, and we have a microphone that'll come to you. Thank you, Josh. Right there. Thanks. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. I was curious. You showed uh, primarily in the sex doll category, female sex dolls. Is there um, like a market? Do male sex doll exist? Do gender non-conforming doll exist? And I was just curious to hear more about that. Yes, there, there are definitely. And um, again, there's so much more out there on this. So there's like documentaries with, um, I forget his name, the guy who owns um, Real, Real Dolls, uh, Mark Mullen or something. Um, there's a lot of interviews with him as the creator of this prominent, uh, now prominent sex, sex adult sex doll company. They do make male dolls. And um, you can custom order a doll, so you could have all sorts of different body configurations, but they are still um, like from a mold. So unless you wanted to pay way more money, you're still limited to what they have as options. But yeah, trans dolls, whatever, whatever you like, um, they're generally customized. 
uh, in terms of ordering like the face. So you're, I think the consumer really gets to feel like they're designing the doll of their dreams as they, as they uh, spend money on that. And um, I think as this becomes more popular, then there's more and more collectors. So there's more and more variety. Same with the reborn dolls. There's more and more different kits that come out um, that have just, yeah, more and more options. So if this uh, becomes more mainstream, which I don't know if it ever will, but that would definitely increase the number of collectors and the number of dolls, the different types of dolls that are available out there. Yeah. Great. Hi, that's amazing, thank you. I'm just struck semantically by the term synthetic relationship. It's obvious why you use that, but in the community, is there any pushback against that when clearly the relationships are sincere? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, early on in my research, I started a blog that would allow me to try to share my research as I go with the community. And um, I've reached out a few times for surveys and questionnaires. But the term synthetic relationship is not something that I've um, really introduced or brought up a whole lot. Um, I felt I, I've, I haven't seen it too many other places, but um, that's a, that would be really something really nice to get feedback on from from folks that are in synthetic relationships. I've heard um, like the term organic has come up in interviews with, in particular, sex doll owners. Again, there's just more interviews with those owners. Um, and then there was, there's different terms people will use. Organic. I can't remember now what some of them are. So there's a few different words floating around there, but I just wanted to emphasize that that uh, it's the it's the companion that's synthetic, and uh, try to draw some boundaries around that for for the purposes of speaking on the topic. Yeah, that's a good question though. Yeah. much. I, uh, I also had a question about synthetic relationships and specifically, um, I'm so glad you brought up model trains and these other kinds of play that can take the form of non-human engagement. Um, and I guess I'm wondering how much wiggle room there is there when we're talking about the synthetic. I mean, can you have a synthetic relationship with your train set or when, when does the, where's the limit of human resemblance here and how does that inform the dynamic at hand? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I don't have my definition in front of me, but for me, it's kind of when there's a sustained engagement and emotional engagement. But um, Freya was just telling me yesterday about uh, people who have uh, someone who has a relationship with a, with a chandelier. Um, so there's like so much out there. Um, that's a good question. But uh, yeah, would, would synthetic relationship, and I don't want to impose that on something, on someone, some, I don't want to impose that term somewhere where it is not. So, um, yeah, but there's definitely some kind of relationship happening here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so I was wondering, you talked a lot about how you've kind of, um, like gone to reborn conventions and like interacted with that community. And I was wondering if the community of people in synthetic relationships or people who use sex dolls, have they been as open as the reborn community or is there still like, how much does the stigma of sex dolls affect your ability to interact with that community? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I have not approached sex doll owners directly. I have not been to a convention, for example, of that of that sort. Um, I've looked at some of the online communities. Um, the Reborn Doll community was so welcoming and so kind to me, especially once I was able to sort of position myself as not trying to sensationalize this or, you know, point a camera in people's faces and, and tell, tell, try to tell a different story. So the photo voice project was a good way to hear from folks directly. Um, and yeah, one of the questions I asked was whether they bring their dolls in public or not. And so there's certainly a privacy and a vulnerability around that, that I think is likely similar for sex doll owners, because you're not going to just go around telling anyone, you know, at work or wherever that you're in this synthetic relationship or that you have this, uh, this doll. But I also asked reborn doll owners on my survey whether they think reborn dolls should become more mainstream or not. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of split, but most people just thought, well, I don't see why it would become more mainstream. A couple people said no, but a, 
majority thought yes because of the benefits. So because this can be so beneficial to people, why not share it and have it become more well known? And in turn, could that maybe reduce some of the stigma against against this? I think the dolls will remain uncanny and creepy, but if we can remove the judgments of the doll owners if they're unjustified, which you know generally they are, um, I think that's a worthwhile kind of questioning. Mm -hmm. um, that's all the time we have for tonight. Um, but as I said, we're going to go out. We have some some more drinks out there. I hope that you'll stick around and, and chat with us for a bit. Um, and I do hope you come back for the next event in the Faculty in Focus series, which is with Heidi Boisvert, who is another artist and scholar, and really picks up where you left off. Uh, because Heidi's work is so much about sort of disembodied dolls, artificial intelligence, and motion capture. Um, but please join me again in thanking Emily St. Hilaire. And thank you all for coming.